Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us from all around the globe and for spending part of your day with us. Um, we're thrilled to have you to continue and to broaden the conversation. This group began at AIDS 2020. My name is Verena Winder. I work for FP 2020. And I'm here just to give a few logistical notes at the top before turning over the program to all of you. So before we get started, um, you should be seeing in front of you a presentation and at the bottom of your screen or of your presentation screen, two different um, pods, one that says Q plus A, where you can submit questions and one when you can send chats to all of the attendees or to the panelists. We encourage you to submit questions at any point during the webinar through these pods. We will actually be incorporating those questions into the live discussion in the latter half of this webinar this morning. So please do use the chat or the Q&A pods to reach us at any time. Um, if you're experiencing any difficulties, you can also email us, and in particular, my colleague, Emma Anderson, at E-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, -E so that's eanderson, at familyplanning2020.org. Lastly, I wanna note for everybody that this webinar is being recorded. So thank you again so much for joining us and for your participation this morning in this important conversation. And I'll turn this now over to Beth Schlachter, the Executive Director of FB 2020. Thank you, Farina, and welcome to all participants. As Farina said, we were thrilled to be able to work with this great panel and great colleagues during the AIDS conference, but also realized there were many folks who were unable to attend that conference even as it was virtual. And so we wanted to bring this important conversation to a broader audience. So I wanna thank everybody for working so well together in recent months to put this together. And we're grateful for your interest in your participation as well. My name is Beth Schlachter. I'm executive director of FP 2020. Let's have the next slide, please. And let me introduce you to what we have prepared for you today. And um, what we're hoping is we'll share some information bring some updates to you about um, family planning, um, HIV intervention, and how those are coming together or not, where there's continued opportunity and what the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been on access to services overall. We have a terrific panel today, and I wanna particularly give a warm welcome and thanks to our partners in co-hosting this at AVAC and to Mitchell Warren and his incredible team. Um, we'll have time to hear from Dr. Rachel Bagley uh, at WHO about the science of both the ECHO trial and the guidance that WHO are continually uh, putting out and updating on services, SRHR services in the time of COVID. So I know Rachel's presentation will be um, really interesting to folks as well. And then we'll have a great panel discussion as well with Dr. Nurazo Ngodi uh, from Zimbabwe, Wame Jalo from Botswana and Dr. Natasha Kawama from Zambia. So without further ado, um, let's get started with uh, what we have prepared for you today. Um, I'm gonna share a bit of an intro. So next slide, please. As we were working together to get ready for the AIDS conference, we thought it would be a really, one thing that we could add that's a value add is a place where this idea that's been worked on for so by so many of you for many decades now of integrated services particularly for srh but with a specific focus on access to contraception on access to um, comprehensive hiv services including addressing all stis that we should really be helping to drive that together and so we created a website called srhintegration.org to try to capture the evidence and capture the work of what's happening in the world to drive this, um, this agenda forward. And one of the things we did was we asked a number of experts and advocates um, to create a one minute video, um, just responding to the question, what does, success, what does successful family planning, HIV and SRHR integration look like to you? So you can find this series of videos on that website and we encourage you to contribute information to help us build this out and make it a useful landing place and resource for our entire community. Next slide, please. 
So I'm just going to briefly introduce the ECHO trial because uh, Rachel is going to go into that in, in much greater detail for us this morning. But for those who may not know, the Evidence for Contraceptive Options and HIV Outcomes tr a Trial, the ECHO study, assessed the impact of three different contraceptive options on women's HIV risk. And it found a lot of important um, or it had a, a number of important findings, including that there was no substantial risk um, or difference in risk uh, among those options for women who were using. But what it also found were incredibly high rates of HIV across the study trial and also incredibly high rates of unintended pregnancy, particularly for adolescents and um, young women and particularly for unmarried women. Many of you may also be aware that uh, just yesterday, the Guttmacher Institute released their annual update of the Adding It Up report. And that continues to track um, a much broader number than FP2020 does of unmet need for contraceptive for women and girls, showing that um, in over 130 countries, there are still 218 million women and girls who have an unmet need for contraception. And critically, again, they reinforced this finding that for young women aged 15 to 19, there's a 43% um, unmet need for contraception. So we continue to not understand the needs of young women and to not meet those needs. And so today's discussion is going to have a particular focus on that. What can we do more? What are we learning? Where are we still missing these gaps in terms of what we're trying to address and trying to understand? Next slide, please. For FP 2020, we do an annual update of uh, figures as well related to contraception. This slide is already out of date. Um, it, was, it measures from July 2018 to July 2019. We will release a report at the end of this year um, updating the, these numbers uh, to show the impact um, from 2019 through 2020. And that will capture some of what we'll know at that point of the impact of the of COVID on um, service delivery and on the well being for women and girls. Um, but our numbers largely track as well with what Guttmacher is finding. But again, unmet need and the unmet potential for integrated services is really where we think we need to be driving our attention in order to, um, in order to do what we are all setting out to do through our programs, which is again to improve services and the quality of services to better meet the needs of women and girls. Next slide, please. Um, so I, I've pretty much said everything that's on this already. Um, but again, it's just to bring that focus back to the potential that we have for how integrated services can um, meet the needs of, of all women with this particular focus on women and girls. And we want to make a call out here as well that um, we see integrated services again as reaching all um, services to address STIs, including for cervical cancer. So next slide, please. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Rachel Bagley, who's the unit head for testing prevention and populations team for global HIV, hepatitis, and STI programs at the World Health Organization. So with that, over to you, uh, Rachel. Thank you very much, Beth, and thank you very much, FP2020 and AVAC, and um, particularly uh, Mitchell Warren for in inviting me to be part of this, this webinar. Um, it's really amazing to think we are really a year after ECHO. Um, so um, it's really time to think, what did that tell us and, and what do we need to do? Next slide, please. We've been thinking about ways to integrate HIV and sexual reproductive health and rights for more than 25 years. And um, I borrowed this slide from a colleague of mine who, who basically mapped out all the, um, all the things that we've done, all the documents, all the meetings, all the declarations that we've had. A huge amount of thought has, has happened. And there have been some tremendous successes. Um, prevention of mother to child transmission has been a tremendous success in that we have fully integrated HIV testing and treatment into antenatal care. And this has resulted not only in providing women um, living with HIV with treatment um, in large numbers through antenatal clinic, but preventing um, huge numbers of infants acquiring HIV. 
So this is a massive success, but some areas have really been left behind. And integrating HIV and STIs into contraceptive services in high burden settings is one of those. Next slide. When we look at the policies, and this is a slide I, I borrowed from uh, IPPF, I think, um, uh, um, uh, which really shows that the HIV world has been thinking a lot about sexual reproductive health and a lot of integration has happened on paper, particularly um, in their policies um, um, and guidance. Dark is, 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 um, is good and light is, is not so good. Um, whereas you look on the reverse in uh, sexual reproductive health strategies, HIV integration has been much um, less well thought through. Next slide. So as Beth said, this ECHO trial um, was in some ways reassuring. I think, you know, we were all um, relieved that three long acting contraceptive methods that were studied um, were all acceptable. Um, they were safe and they all were highly effective in preventing unplanned pregnancies. But it was also at the same time very shocking. Um, these were young women, young women attending um, contraceptive services um, in, in four countries in East and Southern Africa. And overall, um, nearly 4% of them um, acquired HIV um, during in each year. But I think it's also really important to point out, as we all know, women are not all the same everywhere. And if you unpick this data, younger women, women who had more than one partner, and women who reported having um, a sexually transmitted infection um, had much higher HIV risk. And there was also a much higher HIV risk um, uh, uh, according to geography. And the sites in South Africa and East Swatini um, had a much higher HIV incidence, up to 6% in some sites, um, and much lower in Zambia and Kenya. What I think is the big take home message um, from this study and what we need to work on together is that it's crucial that um, colleagues working and, and providing sexual reproductive health services and HIV providers need to work together. Um, too long has this been siloed and it really needs to come from both sides um, and we need to overcome some of the barriers um, in family planning clinics to discuss HIV risk, to discuss HIV testing and counselling, um, and find really feasible and acceptable ways to integrate services, both for women and for providers. Next slide, please. So post-ECHO, a real refocus is needed. And I think we all understand, um, as Beth said, the primary aim of family planning of contraceptive services is to provide women with choices of safe and effective contraception. But in the meantime, we must also recognize that it is an opportunity um, in high burden settings to augment these with HIV testing. Um, and for all women, uh, we can offer, and I must really um, emphasize here, voluntary testing of partners, um, condoms, of course, STI services, and never forgetting intimate partner violence. Women with HIV who are diagnosing these settings can be linked to immediate offer of antiretroviral therapy. And for HIV negative women, um, a, range of contracept, a range of HIV prevention service can be discussed. Um, this may seem a lot, but we need to think of creative ways of providing these services within, within contraception services. And for example, um, there are innovations such as HIV self-testing, um, where women can test themselves using um, a, um, an oral swab. And this could be offered in the waiting area um, as women waited um, to see um, a contraceptive provider. Next slide. So after um, the results of ECHO came out, um, we had a long, hard thing in WHO, and together with partners in UNAIDS and in WHO, we worked absolutely hand, hand in hand with our colleagues um, in the sexual reproductive health um, department to think what are the actions um, that are needed. And we produced this, this policy brief, um, and it's available on the web, so please do look at it. Um, and um, it was also launched as part of the Global Prevention Coalition, of which um, 
AVAC is, an, is, is a key member. So this is really a collective um, thinking of what we can do, um, really to highlight that changes are needed for better services for adolescent girls and young women who are at high risk of uh, acquiring HIV and STIs who are accessing contraceptive services, highlighting that approaches should be evidence-based and women-centered, um, prioritizing actions in, in settings with high HIV burden, but also recognizing that even in low and medium prevalence settings, there are women who continue to be at high HIV risk. And these often, often are women from vulnerable populations, um, particularly key populations. Next slide. And this is just a, um, 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 a, a screenshot of, of one of the um, uh, one of the tables from the from this policy brief, which really shows how you can um, prioritize actions across different epidemiological settings. So if you go right um, to um, along along to the right there, you can see this these are the high burden settings. These are these are places like Eswatini um, and and South Africa where really um, the first emphasis should happen. Next slide, please. So we do need to offer a range of prevention choices to women who are HIV negative, but at substantial risk um, of acquiring HIV. And the, the, um, when, when, this was, when we presented, this at, presented um, work on this at, um, at, the, um, at the AIDS conference, there were a lot of discussion on PrEP and how we need to get PrEP much more available for, for, for um, young women in high burden settings. And we really want to think of ways we can do this, either to provide within um, contraceptive services or provide linkages and support to link to PrEP services. But it's not all about PrEP. And we really must still continue um, to support male and female condoms, better male involvement, um, and um, continue to prioritize voluntary medical male circumcision for men in parallel. Because if men have less um, HIV, um, this has knock-on benefits for, for, for women. And we have PrEP now, a, a, a tablet um, that's highly effective if taken every day. Um, and there are many women who have started PrEP and are really um, able to take this and find this highly acceptable and effective. But there are many women who find difficulties um, with taking an, um, an oral tablet. But we do have, um, looking to the future, we have other products. And I really want to highlight here um, the Depivirine Ring. AVAC yesterday um, held another webinar um, where they um, provided the opportunity to discuss um, the Depivirine Ring and the fact that it has now um, received what's called a positive opinion by um, the European Medical um, um, Agency that. Um, uh, regulates um, uh, products and this paves the way for the depivirine ring to be um, to be made available in in uh, in for, for women in low and middle income um, countries and WHO now that we have this positive opinion on the on the depivirine ring will work um, quick as quickly as possible um, to provide um, guidance on this. And there are other things that are coming in along the pipeline. There is a combination of PrEP and the, um, and the oral contraceptive pill, a co-formulated tablet, so that will give um, women who, um, um, who find taking the oral contraceptive pill um, um, acceptable the opportunity to take that alongside PrEP. Um, there is another PrEP drug, um, FTAF, but unfortunately that has only been, um, the trials have only been in men, um, so we await um, future trials um, for women. This is a smaller tablet, um, so maybe easier to take, um, but unfortunately, um, you know, um, there are no, there's no data on women at the moment. Long-acting cabotegravir, again, the trial results which were, prevented, which were presented at um, AIDS 2020 showed that in a, in a study with a uh, large study of, of men, uh, men who have sex with men and transgender women who have sex with men, this to be highly, highly effective at, at um, preventing HIV. And we wait um, really with um, great hope um, that there will be um, similar results for the women's trial, which is ongoing and is likely to have results um, at the end of this year or early next year, um, if COVID doesn't interrupt those studies too much. 
And then there are other things. There are other projects, vaccines and um, et cetera, um, that are in trials and maybe could offer um, additional choices um, for prevention for women. Next slide, please. In the, in the ECHO study, it wasn't only the bad news about um, HIV um, being um, uh, uh, HIV, risk of HIV um, being um, really so significant, but also at baseline and during um, taking contraception, both the prevalence and incidence of STIs was, um, was really very high. And currently, um, STI services for, um, for women are inadequate in most low and middle income countries, relying on syndromic management, which is not um, a good way of supporting STI management because it misses many women who have asymptomatic infection. So we really need more attention on STIs. Um, we need better diagnostics and we need to work together to reduce um, the prices of um, the tests, the, 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 the etiological diagnosis of, of STIs. Next slide, please. So it really is time. We've had a year, we have started work. We know that COVID is interrupting things and we need, we need however, to continue the push um, on, uh, on actions post echo. Because women want, need and deserve much more HIV prevention access and choice. Women who seek contraception in high HIV burden services in countries should be able to learn their HIV status, they should be able to access treatment for themselves easily and have a range of choices to protect themselves from HIV. We must continue to push for better STI management in women and as we develop these services together we must listen to women, we must involve women because if services are going to be acceptable and effective, women's, women's um, voices must be absolutely at the centre. We must work with national, with national governments to overcome regulatory barriers, for example, for HIV self-testing um, and PrEP to make those more widely available. And I think we can talk and talk and talk, but what we really want is to make some national commitments, set some targets, some provincial targets, and commit to training providers so that they feel comfortable um, at doing what they're doing, which is often, um, you know, which would be providing contraceptive choices, but also responding to the post-echo um, um, uh, agenda in also feeling comfortable at providing HIV testing, prevention, um, etc. And keep our eyes and ears open for innovations. Next slide. As you and I and everybody on this call, COVID is just overwhelming us. Um, and I think, you know, um, I couldn't end this talk without thinking about COVID. Um, and I've just come off a call just before this one, um, a WHO call um, with all our regions, talking about the disruption of services. And when we look at the disruption of services, what comes really, really at the top? It's quite shocking. It's contraception services. These are ones that are really falling off the radar in the times of COVID, as we are um, reducing um, clinic opening hours, reducing access to clinics, people are unable to get there because of transport and, and stay at home policies. Contraception services are really um, being hard hit. Um, and I think we really need in the time of COVID, and it's going to be for the long haul. I think we all hoped that we would have, um, uh, you know, the stay at homes, these immediate um, um, impacts and, and that, you know, we could somehow weather the storm and, and things would come out the other side. But I think we're all recognizing now, we are in the long haul for the response to COVID. So we also need to really maintain contraceptive services and prioritize contraceptive services. Because um, we don't want, we don't want um, uh, um, women to have un un unplanned pregnancies um, and we also don't want to, um, to continue to keep women vulnerable to, to HIV prevention. So, so commodities like condoms need to be continued to be, um, to be supplied in the community. We've also thought of ways of making prep delivery more community delivered, um, again, to reduce time um, that, that um, people have to go to clinics. 
we have to think about HIV self-testing as ways women can, can test um, without um, 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 without um, the necessity to be in close contact with somebody else. And I think we have to really think now, we're not going to um, have a small blip where these services are, are disrupted. I think we have to learn from what we're doing now and hopefully some of these actions will go along into the future and we'll have better um, more empowered services for women um, particularly embracing um, the self-care agenda so thank you very much for last slide please i just want to thank um, avac and um, fp 2020 um, i also want to thank my colleagues um, at who particularly michelle rudolph and shola de Lau and my colleagues in um, the Sexual Reproductive Health Department and my colleagues in UNAIDS. So thank you very much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. That was incredibly informative and very helpful. So I wanna turn it over now to Mitchell Warren of AVAC who will moderate our panel discussion. Mitchell, over to you. Great, good afternoon, good morning all. And I am, um, why don't you know, Rena? If you just want to go to the very last that I was, I, I think I'd rather get to the conversation. Much of this, Rachel covered so beautifully, and Rachel, thank you so much. And I'm delighted you're going to be part of the panel to take some of these very questions, along with three other fantastic colleagues uh, whose names you heard. I believe we have um, uh, uh, the opportunity to see people, um, but I'll introduce them real quickly, and then maybe we can even take the slides down. Uh, but we have Niraza Mahodi from Zimbabwe, as you heard from the University of Zimbabwe um, and the University of California, San Francisco collaborative research program there, who's been involved in pretty much every recent clinical trial um, focused on um, finding new methods for women. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll talk about that. Um, Wame Jalo, based in Botswana with the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition, who's been a, a driver of great global advocacy, putting women at the center. And uh, Natasha Koma from uh, Copper Rose, Zambia, um, who's been very involved with FP2020 on the reference group, I believe, uh, and really brings an important voice from, from, uh, from, from, from Zambia and from Africa generally. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome everybody here. Um, and, and maybe what we'll, we'll, we'll do to start, and, and Rachel, you um, really did such a beautiful job giving a sense of, of where we are, and I wanna give a special thanks to you and your team um, throughout WHO and UNAIDS on the guidance that came out just a couple of months ago. Um, I realize people have many documents to read. Um, I really encourage you to take a look at that one because I think it really sets the stage importantly for, um, for, for the conversations. Um, but I wonder, I, I think maybe I'll start with you, Wame. I'm not to put you on the spot, but I will. Um, you know, six months ago or so, um, at what was actually the first virtual conference in the times of COVID, the, the retrovirus conference uh, um, that was meant to be in Boston, you did a remarkable um, presentation um, about um, the realities on the ground in March. And again, that was just weeks into what has now become this crazy new normal of, of COVID. And, and I just wonder, you know, thinking now over a year since the ECHO result and all that Rachel described in that really beautiful slide showing the decades of conversations around this issue of integration. Um, sitting here in, in, in now almost August 2020, um, is anything different from your perspective on the ground um, for, for, for policy, for advocacy, and most of all for women um, at, at, the, at the community and, 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 and site level um, in terms of all that we've known and talked about for so long? I think, <clears throat> thank you, Mitchell, for that. I mean, this is a very uh, good, great question. And uh, I think we, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to really quantify what has happened. And um, it really is important for us, I think, to think about how we collect, systematically collect data to actually demonstrate what is the situation on the ground from the community perspective, from the recipients of care perspective, and use it to further improve on some of the findings that ECHO actually revealed. I mean, right now we actually don't know much. And with COVID, um, it is, the, the world has exploded. And as a result of that, um, we're all sort of running now to sort of collect the data that we need to inform programs. Uh, you know, one of the things that um, ECHO um, really emphasized was the need for um, more aggressive HIV, STI prevention and management um, services for, for prevention and integration 
With COVID, we've seen a lot of rapid change in policies that are allowing greater access. But I think like Rachel's presentation rightly pointed out, there are still some um, treatment and service access barriers that have not yet been uh, dealt with. And more and more we're seeing stockouts of contraception, we're seeing lack of integrated service delivery. Um, and in, in, the light, in light of COVID, as people are coming into the health facilities in fear, um, how can we try and maximize on this opportunity? So while there's some gains, I, I don't think we have a full breadth of that knowledge, um, Mitchell, at all, because we're not collecting that data. We're not actually speaking to the users and saying, what is happening on the ground and how can we use it to improve our services and uh, how can we maximize on all this change policy changes that are all of a sudden happening as a result of covid no that, that's great well I, mean, I think that's so important and, and i think particularly with, with beth and fp 2020 on the line and co hosting this um data have been such a, a critical part of fp 2020's role and i think you saw that in the slide that that, um, that Beth did, I think um, really coming back to that in real time to be able to make some of those decisions is, is going to be so important. You know, one of the things um, that I, a question came up early on in, in, in the chat, which I think is so important, you know, in, in many respects, ECHO did provide um, the state of the art uh, care in, in those programs, the clinics and the trial sites that did ECHO um, really did incredible jobs of, of um, of counseling, of, of provision, both of HIV and family planning, and, and yet we had this high incidence rate. And, and one, one of the pieces that came up, oral PrEP was only introduced very, very late in the trial because of the approvals at national levels. Um, so uh, PrEP's uh, role was relatively limited. But a question came up early on um, about, um, are there examples of PrEP provision within FP and SRH programs? And, and you know, I wonder, I mean, sitting there in Zimbabwe, where you have not only been a a groundbreaking pioneering researcher, but also um, looking at the clinical side. And I know you posted a document from Zimbabwe, but I wonder if you might shed some light on um, on really getting practical. You know, is is it possible to deliver HIV testing and prep in family planning and SRH services? And 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 what are we seeing already? And and what more do we need to do? Um. Thank you very much, uh, Michel, and thank you everyone, um, all the co-presenters. So uh, I think I would be doing myself and my participants and all my um, uh, collaborators in injustice if I don't start by really just uh, saying how happy I am where we are today in terms of the EMA, uh, European Medicines uh, Agency, um, opinion on, on the Dapiferin ring. So I really just want to thank all our participants and all the research teams and all the um, supporters, everyone who supported the Dapiferin ring to be where we are at today. And it's such a, um, it's, it's good news in the, in the wake of uh, gr the grimness of COVID-19. So I, but I really want to say thank you to everyone uh, who's had a part, anything to do with the Dapiferin ring and we, we now forge ahead so that women can have this, um, this uh, woman-controlled HIV prevention method available to them so that we should never, ever, ever have any new HIV infections. So coming back to the question, do I think that it's possible to deliver uh, PrEP and HIV testing and all the care in family planning clinics? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, if I'm looking at uh, where I sit, uh, our clinic is in the Zimbabwe National Family Planning Council uh, premises. And the council has really done a lot of work and um, they, they are integrating uh, sexual reproductive health services. There is uh, HIV testing, there's PrEP delivery, and uh, they offer PrEP. And uh, they even go further and offer women uh, not just contraception, but uh, cervical cancer screening. I would need to confirm with them if they do breast cancer screening, but I know it's, a, it's a many services under one roof. So it is, a, it is possible to do that. What we need um, for it to be successful, really, uh, we need uh, good governance, yes, uh, which we already have uh, in, in my country. We need a strong visionary leadership, uh, we need um, 
uh, perhaps a supportive organizational and policy environment. We also need dedicated resources and infrastructure. Of course, without that, we can't really integrate our services. And um, we also need uh, some strategies to remove uh, or to reduce barriers to the progress. I think Wame or Rachel, someone has already talked about uh, the barriers that could be there. So it is possible, yes, it's possible to have integration. Uh, but overall, also, we need um, good, effective oversight of the programs that we are doing um, that are integrating services. So I believe it's possible we need to have the willpower. We need to harness um, the resources that we have, but we also need to have uh, buy-in of the important stakeholders, the policymakers, the end user. We need the end user to be to be heavily involved because we might have beautiful products uh, mm -hmm. that we need to roll out. But if the end user is not, um, we don't have the buy-in of the end user, uh, it won't really be successful. So I believe, I'm positive it is possible, but it's a multidisciplinary, multifactorial uh, mm -hmm. a discipline where we need various um, uh, people and disciplines chiming in. Thank you. Great, Niranzo, thank you so much. And actually, one of the things I didn't say at the outset, but coming out of both the AIDS 2020 meeting and this conversation, we, we've all wanted to get very practical um, and, and really set some metrics for what the next year looks like. And I think you actually provided us one. Um, it's interesting when you think about oral prep within the context of FP and SRH programs, we're having that conversation um, 10 years since we knew that oral prep was safe and effective, uh, um, mm -hmm. five years since it was first approved by the first two African regulators in in Kenya and South Africa. And, and so maybe one metric is that a year from now, um, when the vaginal ring hopefully is approved and available um, in Africa, um, in different countries, um, that actually one of the primary initial delivery points, not five years later, but at outset of product introduction, should be its fundamental integration in FP and HIV. And so maybe that's a, a very specific actionable call that we all can make coming out of, of, this, of this series of conversations. So I'm so glad you raised that. Um, and, and I'm so glad you ended actually with what probably is the most important place always to begin, and that is with, with end users and with young women at the center. And I wonder, Natasha, um, one of the things that Nigranzo said actually relates to something Rachel presented, the, the need to, to really look at policies, at, at programs and providers, but all of it has to be guided by the end user. And I wonder, given your amazing work at, at Copper Rose in Zambia, if you can give us some, some insights on, on what practically can and should we be doing differently so that that end user conversation isn't a new conversation, but rather one um, that, that um, we actually just take as a given, for, as a starting point. Hey, thanks, Mitchell. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I just want to refer back to something you mentioned. And for me, from last year and even now, the one thing I think about when I think about the ECHO trial is that people receive the gold standard of treatment, which is they received the drugs, they were checked on every month, but they still got HIV and the STI rates are high. And for me, I'm thinking that what we really need to do is to be trying out new approaches. We need to do something different. We need to do things we've never done before if we want to see anything change. Because even if we give the whole population, all populations everything, we're seeing that they will still get HIV and the STI rates are high. At uh, Copperos, we're trying out a couple of things. Um, being a youth-led organization and being young, we have <laughs> the opportunity to try out stuff, even if all these, I won't say adult allies, because I think I'm getting closer to being an adult myself. Um, but I'm just saying that even things which big organizations have said don't work, we are trying them out and seeing how best we can use use them. And so what we're doing is that, I'll give a tangible example, we have trained young people as community-based distributors for family planning methods. And this is something which nobody has done. There are community-based distributors in, in rural areas, but not urban. So we're trying out these urban areas with young people and trying to see how we can what we can do and as we go we are documenting our experiences we're also documenting experiences of the people um, that we're working with and in the wake of the COVID pandemic we have seen how some of these 
I would like to say NGO politics. To, um, there is a lot of politics around integration because some sectors within the scope of integration have more funding than others. And I'll give a tangible example. Um, when COVID started, people are getting six months supply of antiretroviral drugs, but we are not even meeting the three month supply guideline that the Ministry of Health has said. Copa Rose has lots of condom distribution points and we can't get enough condoms to put in those dispensers. And so because of the funding dynamics, family planning has significantly less funding than um, HIV. Well, I don't know about where you are, but in Zambia, it's very clear. And so if we want to see something different, we need more investments in some of these um, things for us to see a meaningful integration because if people can get six months of ART and um, the young people we're working with can't get condoms, then that's a thing because yeah, there are supply issues, but how come ART is still getting into the country? Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll end here for now. Now that, that's fabulous, Natasha, and I'm so glad you, you, well, I'm so glad you said so many things, but two things I want to just really thank you for. One is that um, we, 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 we old adults need to get out of the way and, and really uh, your, your vision and passion, uh, um, and I see Wame smiling too on the younger side of things. Um, it's great to see that driver um, because that's where it has to happen for the future. Um, and this other issue, one of the things that we've all been talking a lot about in HIV is this idea of differentiated service delivery, which was a uh, an idea early on in, in HIV treatment programs and how we provide it um, in prep, in family planning, and how we do it in the wake of COVID. And this may be one of the areas where we wanna make sure that, that COVID gives us a good um, leave behind, so to speak. And, and uh, um, there's so many bad things happening right now, but that may be a good thing to change service delivery going forward. But the other thing you said, which is actually something I'd love to ask all the panel, including you, Beth, to kind of think on, because uh, it came up um, early on as, as a question uh, in, in the chat as well. Um, politics and with politics money, um, you know, and, and this issue of who has the money, um, who decides, and, um, and, and the silos of funding in HIV and family planning. And Rachel, you mentioned STIs, which um, really have no funding by comparison to either HIV or reproductive health. Uh, STIs seem to be the, 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 the lost uh, um, program, really, in terms of funding. Um, how do we reimagine funding. And I know I recognize just to say that none of us on the screen, at least, I know some people on the line are funders, none of us are funders, but what, what should we be advocating for? What should we be thinking about? Because we have great guidelines, great policies, but if funders won't let you do X or if silo Y is over here and the woman is over there, how do we address this? Anyone want to start? I see lots of smiles. Can, I, ahead, just, can I just say, um, I do think we do have an opportunity with the Global Fund. I do think the Global Fund um, really has recognized the post-ECHO agenda. Mm. And I think, um, you know, some countries are starting to include this in their concept notes, and there are some really important countries coming up in the next round. And it's a really big opportunity because they, they, they don't want to continue to work in silos. They recognize the need that that contraception, HIV, STIs are absolutely critical for adolescent girls and young women and they will fund them. What I do think is important though, is at these conversations, these are not led entirely by the HIV team. We need to bring mm. the contraceptive um, leads into this conversation because we have been siloed. And of course, you know, for the past decade, HIV has been in a relatively privileged position because we PEPFA, we have the Global Fund, um, and, you know, I think other providers have felt, wow, you know, they, they just do their own thing and, and we have to go and do our thing and we're not privileged to um, all the resources and, um, that, that, um, that they have. But I think ECHO was a wake-up call and we must use it and we must ask the Global Fund to support um, much more sexual, reproductive um, and health choices. And I think, um, as, as somebody said, um, um, Natasha, you're young, I am really old, um, but it is the voices of young women in countries um, mm. who need to go and lobby those CCMs and um, really mm. their issues on board that will change things. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rachel. 
<laughs> just to I mention, did. Rachel, um, I literally almost got in a fist fight with someone at a CCM meeting because of how strongly I was speaking about including something in the budget. So, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you would have won, I have no doubt. What, Wame, were you going to jump in there too? Yeah, I was going to jump in. I, I really love this conversation. Uh, that is, that's, uh, it, it's, but it's, I think times are changing, right? Um, you now have um, people who are more uh, knowledgeable, are more empowered about their health and actually want to be in the driving seat, right? So how do we maximize on that? And I, and I, and I can strongly emphasize the need for having women-centered approaches where women are at the front and center of the conversations, planning, the research, et cetera. And we see that from all the different data that, that is out there. You know, there's limited involvement of women in research. There's limited uh, inclusion of women in these conversations. And so as from ITPC's perspective, you know, we're, we're very strongly advocate for treatment education because once you empower somebody to understand the choices that they have before them, they will make the right informed choices around their health and they would adhere to their health because of that. And so I think we really need to strengthen our research. We need to strengthen uh, the documentation. I just want to highlight that um, there's an uh, I International Aid Society and EPI um, document that was actually released around the differentiated um, ART models for strengthening family care. And it, it really involved uh, conversations with women around what do you want? How do we do by differentiated service delivery that matters to you? And this is what they said. I mean, they had really five uh, strong points, which is, you know, engaging women and girls living with HIV in the conversation and in the decision making, utilizing differentiated service delivery referrals and follow up as an opportunity for continuing of family care, um, promote long term um, or long acting uh, reserve, sorry, reversible um, contraceptives amongst mm. clients that are accessing differentiated service delivery. And I think this speaks to the point earlier on integration on services and how are we, what are the lost opportunities that we're, we're missing? Um, the alignment of contraceptives and ART resupplies and ART, um, differentiated ART um, delivery models and integrating family services. It's a supplement that's available. Please uh, read through it because it really does outline what do women want? What are women saying? And I think the more and more we ask this question, the more and more data we collect, um, we were able to really hone in on the policies and services that actually meet the needs. Great. Niranzo or, or Beth, anything you want to add on the funding side? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not the correct person to comment on funding, but what are, from a clinician's point of view, I really would like the funders to let's come back to STIs. Um, mm. You did mention STIs a bit. If we ignore the STIs, really mm. all the gains we've made in the past for HIV will come to naught. So I think Rachel was it talked about point of care testing for, for STIs. So I would really, when the funds come, I would really want to see a point of care testing being included in the in integrated care so that when a woman comes in, she has a HIV test, pregnancy test, she has a point of care STI test. Why do I say that? Uh, we've already heard that most of the STIs are asymptomatic. And here in most of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, we rely on uh, uh, symptomatic uh, syndromic management. So we'll miss the majority of STIs and by so doing, the women remain at, uh, at risk for HIV. So I'm not an advocate, but this is <laughs> what I would really uh, advocate for or advise in terms of uh, funding. So let's not forget STIs, because if we do, we'll do so at our own peril, uh, because um, STI. And there's so many other things, infertility associated with STIs. It's, just, it's not just the risk of HIV. Uh, cancer of the cervix associated with HPV. So let's include all those point of care cervical cancer screening uh, and um, include it in all the integrated services. Yeah, thank you. Great, Nira, so that was super, except the one thing I'll say when you, you're totally wrong, and I hate to say that to a panelist, but when you say you're not an advocate, I, I've never heard something dumber. Um, you are an amazing advocate. You may have trained as a researcher, but I have learned so much from you. So you are an advocate. Um, thank you, thank you. 
Beth, can we fix the funding silos? <laughs> Do you have a magic wand you're going to wave for us? Oh my God. You know, it's Natasha, your comment around ART being prioritized and available in six months and the fracture within the family planning community. I'll just be clear Family Planning 2020 was stood up as a way of pulling the community together, but that partnership was disempowered from the beginning because we never coalesced around funding. And for all the stigma there is around HIV, it seems there's even more around sexual behavior that leads to pregnancy and the fact that women don't want to be pregnant all, you know, or they want to be pregnant when they want to be pregnant, but not all the time be vulnerable to pregnancy. And we haven't solved that. And so we're still picking around the edges around trying to figure out how we actually in a coherent and coordinated way prioritize access to family planning. Rachel, your comment about WHO talking openly about how this has been deprioritized and falling through the cracks is a result of this fracture that still exists within family planning and our ability to talk about sexuality. I'm really impressed by the ability of the HIV community over these periods of time. And I, and I wonder, you know, we all know what those drivers were of getting a global fund, having UNAIDS, having a PEPFAR that can be responsive to local needs. That was decades in the making. And yet we're still picking around the edges. Why is that? And it's always down to the politics. It's around the issues around women and gender. And we are not where we need to be on that. And until we can get real on that, we're going to continue to have the same challenges and problems. No, Beth, thank you. And, and of course, you're absolutely right. I, I wonder, again, just thinking practically, because I think we want to end this call as we did the last one and, and really with an agenda for the future. And obviously, we, we, we haven't any of us solved for that at the, at the macro level. But I wonder if there is an opportunity here to take your point, Rachel, about this, this moment. Um, you know, coming out of ECHO, uh, you know, WHO, both through HIV and the Reproductive Health and Research Program, talked about these task teams that really meant to prepare for ECHO. I wonder if not even everywhere, but if we could just collectively in, in two or three countries work with those task teams, work with the Global Fund, work with PEPFAR, uh, and, and work with the family planning programs and really come up with a consolidated women's health agenda. And I realize that's something that's been done in many places, but I think sometimes we think let's come up with the global fix rather than if we could do that in one or two or three countries and show that it's possible to get the global fund to invest in this way and to integrate with a family planning program that's very practical. Um, and I wonder if that's something we, we should really be coming out with, with clarity that says, here are two or three places where we are actually going to really focus where it's possible to make this happen. Um, and show the way forward. Um, and maybe they're also thinking about where the delivering ring helps, you know, bring that all of those pieces together. Um, and again, it, it sounds rather Pollyanna, but it just feels like something that we should get very practical and granular on and, and bring those agencies together at the country level. And maybe eventually the global, the global leads will follow. Sorry, I'm not a panelist. I was just coming up. I was just I reflecting on what you all were saying. I couldn't agree more, Mitchell. I think this is definitely what we have to do. And I want to also say we've got to really um, encourage um, the advocates, encourage um, women um, um, in communities, because frankly, um, with the Dipivirine Ring, it was their push that really maintained, along with the researchers and, the, um, and, uh, and IPM, it was, it was having the advocates, having African women behind that kept that momentum going through all the ups and downs. And now I think, you know, Beth, you said, why, why does HIV succeed? That was because of advocates. You know, why did we manage to get Global Fund? Why, you know, it was advocates really saying, these are our rights, we need this. And I think that's, and we've, we've, got, we've got so many wonderful women um, uh, in, in Africa who, who are, are, are starting to really speak out. And I think they need to get every, every CCM um, alongside Natasha. So Natasha doesn't have to fight alone. She needs those other groups with her. And we need that in countries. So let's start, as you say, Mitchell, with mm. five countries and really see if we can get, get some change. Yeah. No, that's great. And Rachel, you actually answered a question that came in the, in the Q&A, but I never even got to ask it from, from um, uh, one of those fabulous uh, women leaders in uh, this one in South Africa, Yvette Raphael, who said, what can we do to assist WHO uh, on the ground to make the push? And I think you answered that. Um, but it makes me think also, it, it, we need, 
I think we often, and Beth and I have talked a lot about how we bring HIV and FP together. And I think maybe even our starting point was maybe wrong. Maybe it's not FP advocates and HIV advocates. It's, for lack of a better term, we need integration advocates that aren't HIV advocates who also think SRH or family planning advocates who also think HIV, but just a, a principled framework that says this is integration first. FP and HIV are actually, and STIs, you know, secondary and tertiary. Um, and maybe that's an advocacy agenda that we need to take forward for the future. Um, I did want to come to an issue that, that we talk a lot about the funders, we already have. We talk a lot about keeping women at the center, the eventual users for both uh, all of these interventions. Um, and in between all of that are providers, of course. Um, and we all hear stories for decades about provider bias, provider challenges. And I wonder if any of you have very practical examples of um, what we need to be doing, particularly to, to think and um, both to bring providers along in new ways, to, to train them differently, and also it relates a bit to a question that came up as well. Um, this whole push recently around self-care. Um, and self-care doesn't mean getting rid of providers, but how do we kind of, what's the future look like when we balance meeting new ways of training providers, new approaches with providers, helping them be empathetic providers, and this idea of self-care? Anyone want to take that on? Um, so I'll, I'll start briefly in terms of what needs to be done uh, uh, to, to take care of provider bias. I'll give a very practical example from one of my studies, maybe, maybe about eight years ago. So, you know, in HIV prevention, uh, when we are looking at uh, new interventions, we really encourage women to be on contraceptives so that we don't have unintended pregnancies. So with the aim of uh, providing... Um, a wide method mix of contraception, we launched into a, a contraceptive action team where we really uh, capacitated our nurses in terms of provision uh, of contraceptives or available long acting reversible contraceptives. Before we started, the uptake of the IUCD was really low because the nurses were not very confident in counseling. They were not confident in inserting mm. the IUCDs and so forth. But after a while, after about three to four months, when we did a reassessment, there was a good contraceptive mix. What is the moral of the story here? You need to capacitate the, uh, the service provider. Because if I don't know how to insert this device, I'm not going to do it. So um, that's the contribution I'll start off with. Mm. You need to... Um, uh, to sensitize and to capacitate the healthcare mm. provider so that they do away with their biases and um, yeah, then they can provide the full services. Thank you. Can I, can I add on to that? And I think obviously, Please. so many things about women's choices that we really will need a skilled, trained and supportive provider. But mm. others, um, women can access themselves. Um, and I think, as, as Mitchell says, you know, one of the hopefully unintended good consequences of COVID is that we will empower people to, um, to have more um, health choices that they can do themselves. And I think, you know, we've started this with self-testing um, from, and there was a lot of um, pushback on self-testing. And now millions of people have self-tested and they can get it from a pharmacy or um, uh, from a partner. And you know, it's, it's an empowering way of, 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 um, of uh, learning your HIV status. And I think we have to respect and put more health choices into people's hands. Um, you know, there are opportunities in, in, in the contraceptive field with Sinopress, for example, um, you know, that, that women don't want to have to spend an entire um, giving up work, spending money on transport to get to a clinic. If they can safely, um, have, that, have that choice. And it's a mixture. You need skilled providers, but you also um, need choices that women um, who feel comfortable and want to use them um, on their own can do so. Great. Thanks, Rachel. I know we, I think we lost Wame uh, for another call at the top of the hour, and I realize we now are at the top of the hour. Um, other quick thoughts on providers, Natasha? Um, well, I, I trained as a doctor, so I am somewhat, I have been a provider, like directly being that person. And what I will say is that I have seen that um, there is a lot of bias, even from my colleagues. I would see my colleagues send away people who want 
certain reproductive health services and things like that. So I think a good place to start would be in the training of providers. And if funders are investing right now, they should be investing in the actual training because as an institution, Coparos, we have trained so many providers, but we see that we'll train these providers. Two years later, those providers move to other places and we have to keep training them. And I think it's not really sustainable. And sometimes people, um, there is the, the aspect of continuous professional mm -hmm. development, but I think it's also, we need to look into how do we put some of these things in the curriculum, for example, or in a more, much more sustainable way. And for the self um, care, I would say that there are some approaches, for example, in Zambia, there are discussions around what self-care means so for example for other conditions like diabetes and things like that they give the first injection within the healthcare facility and subsequent ones you can do at home and that's kind of where the discussion is going around how to roll it out and how to get people to use it there are there's always a risk of misuse for any kind of um, but to be honest, the risk of misuse and the, the more like, what can I say, the downside is outweighed by the benefits of doing it. And I think that it's something that needs to be invested in. But also there will be need to invest in the social and behavioral communication aspect of, of rolling out self-care programs because there's so many misconceptions. And also because contraception does have side effects. And so... How do we manage those? Um, because some people will say things like, the one I injected myself gave me this side effect and this one didn't, even if it was just a coincidence. So I think those are my thoughts around, around that. Great, thank you. Um, and Wame, welcome back. Um, uh, you're just in time. Um, I, I, we just passed the top of the hour and I know people are having to drop off and actually I, my computer's about to die from power outage. So I may um, fall off as well, but maybe um, I'll just, um, uh, I'm going to turn this back to Beth in just a minute, but I do want to give the four of you each a chance to to, to give a last thought. And I wonder if, if um, well, before I do, there was a question that we, we looked at earlier about prep and family planning. I did one of Jen Mason asked it. Uh, it's a really important question. Um, I did post a couple of, of, of um, recent assessments uh, about that. Um, also, I wanted just to, to flag a, one of the, I think, important findings that were presented at the AIDS conference was the search trial, which wasn't specifically about um, uh, prep or, or prevention in family planning per se, but it was a large uh, program in Kenya and Uganda looking at scaling up universal testing and treatment. And what they found was this idea of integration writ large. And it was something you said, Natasha, that made me think about it. Um, you know, it was about diabetes and, and screening for all sorts of, of issues for women and for men that allow a more receptive acceptance to PrEP. The, the PrEP uptake and adherence was higher than we've seen in most programs. And so I think really a great message there about how when you meet people where they are with their concerns and needs, uh, you tend to get better uptake uh, and, and focus. Um, so maybe just in, 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 in each of you giving a, a quick last thought, um, it's easy to think very big and broad about integration. We've been doing it for decades. Um, I wonder if when we gather, as I'm, I'm confident now doing this twice in, in, in a month, we'll wanna do this again often. Um, but if we gather in July 2021, um, what's the success you want to be talking about? Um, one year, so we're not going to change the world necessarily. Um, but um, 12 months from now, when we gather and have this phenomenal panel, um, what's the thing you're going to say, we succeeded in doing because we did X? So we succeeded in X because we did Y. Uh, who wants to start? I'm looking for someone to come off mute. Wame. Fabulous, you win. I, right there. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I would like to hear more diversity in voice among women. Um, you know, we are many different types of women and um, that only happens if we provide more information, more resources to empower women to feel um, able to, to express what the needs are, express um, what the issues are on the ground and how we can merge um, and have uh, better services because of, we've done that. I mean, everybody wants to have a great relationship with the healthcare provider. Everyone wants to be able to bridge that, but we need to provide the tools to do that. So one year from now, I'm hoping we have more diversity because we've been able to reach more women in different ways um, and they're able to express uh, the different needs. We also are able to have more data 
uh, we're able to be able to say this is um, what's missing um, in terms of our mm -hmm. service delivery, the issues on the ground. And um, this is coming from the voices of the community. And that is informing policies that actually change the way that and shape the way we offer services. Fabulous. Next. All right. Uh, what can I say? Um, I think I've just talked about capacity building. So I think uh, one year from now, I think uh, this is this is something doable and it's something which is which can be documented to say uh, between uh, August 2020 and August 2021, how many healthcare providers did we uh, capacitate in terms mm. of uh, sexual reproductive health? So I think that's something which can be done. And we also need uh, to integrate our programs and have coordination. I think someone on the chat uh, lamented the lack of coordination. So we need to have improved coordination mechanisms and we need to provide continuous uh, mentorship and I think it was Natasha Owami, someone who talked about uh, mentorship and on the job training uh, to build capacity, like I've said before. And lastly, maybe we need um, for those uh, areas where they can't, uh, where integration is really, where uh, reorganization of department is difficult. Uh, I think it's easy now to just create a one-stop department so that you say this department we are going to provide ABC all these are sexual reproductive health services so I think um, that can be done and of course to have bi-directional synergies in policy programs and uh, service delivery so that we can meet um, and provide comprehensive SRH HIV and STI health services so yeah. in a nutshell that's I think what we can look forward to thank you beautiful Natasha or Rachel? When I think of, of having this discussion one year from now, I have two thoughts. Um, the first one is I want to see more investment in STIs and mm -hmm. investment both in STI-centered programming or STI integration into existing programs, but also just I need, I need to see more data because with the ECHO, the challenge we've had in Zambia is everyone says there was only one center. So we need to see more data on um, STIs, even if it's only qualitative data, just to understand what's happening on either the providers or even on the part of the young people themselves mm -hmm. on how they feel about STI testing and things like that. The second thing I would like to say one year from now is I would like to see more young people understanding these issues because these discussions are very good, but they're also very technical. Mm -hmm. And as, as corporals, we're trying to see how we can bring this down to the level of the other young people that we work with. And so um, we'd like to see more young people understanding these issues because it's, it's because of, like Rachel said, it's because of advocacy that we saw more funding into some of these things. So we need to build the capacity of our, our colleagues and our friends to be able to have a bigger voice for these issues. Great. Rachel? I'm gonna be very naughty and say two things. Um, one is, is your idea. Mitchell and I think we do have to act on this and really make some concrete concrete progress in some key countries and I think we can we can really do that and I think we've got um, some great opportunities over the next few months um, with, with global fund countries coming up with um, Swatini and Lesotho and later South Africa to really make sure that we have some funding to go behind that um, and my second one is um, I can't remember who said it was probably one may um, women and all that diversity. I do think we have to think about particularly um, young women and particularly women from key populations um, and um, you know stigma and discrimination for accessing contraceptive is writ large, but for women from key populations it's a bigger issue and a more pernicious issues. So I think um, we in WHO are, are revamping our, our, our key populations guidance and I think this is going to be something we really have to think about. Mm -hmm. Great. And before I let Beth give, give, give an answer to that and to close us out, I just want to say thank you. Um, uh, it's just such remarkable conversations and 
90s from everyone. I'll just put in my own two cents, and that is um, I'm stuck on the number four. Um, we talk about that incidence rate that was in the ECHO trial of 4%. It was actually similar a few months later, uh, earlier this year, with the um, HVTN702 vaccine trial. But I went back and looked at every efficacy trial for HIV prevention um, since the mid-2000s. And Niradzo will remember a trial in, in Zimbabwe called MIRA that was looking at the diaphragm for HIV prevention. In 2007, when they reported the trial result where the diaphragm didn't um, reduce infection, the incident rate in both the, the active arm and the, um, and the placebo arm was 4%. And that was 13 years ago. So my vision is that a year from now, the current efficacy drugs, we need to get under four. Um, this is just unacceptable to be sitting at 4% now, almost 20 years uh, into seeing it in every study. So that's our challenge. And um, I look forward to joining everybody uh, a year from now, and maybe hopefully many times before a year from now, um, to chart our progress together. And most of all, I want to thank you, Beth. Um, the partnership with FP2020 continues to inspire and um, um, brings uh, conversations like this together. So thank you for being such an amazing partner. And over to you. Thanks, Mitchell. We all, it's, it's, everyone knows here that we just, we feel a real synergy between these issues and these organizations. And this is just one opportunity. And we deeply are committed to continuing this conversation. So thank you. And thanks to all the panelists and, and many thanks to everybody for sticking with us for this conversation. I think it shows the depth of the interest. Um, you know, FP 2020, it's, it's in our name that uh, we're changing this year. And a lot of the work that we're doing, it's, it's delayed because of COVID and, and that's fine. We'll continue to um, extend our ambition um, because we're working into the next decade through partnership. But the idea is that we will build um, regional hubs from the secretariat. So the secretariat will be devolved and closer to those of you who are working in the countries. And it's so clear that the key focus we need to have there is on the advocacy and bringing the data that we have um, Natasha Prayer asked to ensure that that's aligning with the greater data sets as well for understanding a need to empower advocates with the messages and the information that will help to drive this change. And that I hope that because through these, um, these hubs, our number one goal for the next year can be to ensure that we have integrated advocacy approaches so that we're bringing all the issues that women are facing with regard to their health together so that advocates aren't having to argue for family planning here and for HIV um, uh, access or to treatment for HIV access over there, but rather that we are organized ourselves so that we're supporting advocates to drive that agenda. And that we can do this as we operationalize these hubs and that should be our number one priority. So you have my commitment to try and frame this next um, iteration of the FP, what we will likely be an FP 2030 partnership with that framing in mind. And that it's up to us to drive that integration. And so we have that opportunity. Let's take it. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for participating today and we'll continue to bring these conversations forward and provide a space for the community to hear from all of you and for all of us to learn together because it's quite clear, particularly with COVID and the fragility that we're all feeling, that we, there's a moral imperative to getting this integrated approach right over time. I, I know I'm preaching to the, to the choir here. You all have been working on this for decades, but we who have control over these systems have to compel that change ourselves as well and then get out of the way so that advocates can get the services um, in the shape that are going to best seat uh, or meet the needs of the women in, in communities and and um, within the the countries where you're living and working so thank you for your partnership thank you for your interest in this please continue to help us shape these agendas at a global level in a way that's supportive and not in the way of everything that you're trying to do um, in your country. So thank you again and just wishing you all good health and that you stay um, healthy along with your families during this incredibly challenging time. So thank you for your partnership and, and best wishes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.